Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I'm David Fallis, and it uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome you this evening to this wonderful recreation of a service, almost. Uh, we're not pretending that this is going to be a, a, mus a, a worship service, but we're having all the musical elements from uh, what we think might be in a Lutheran Vesper service for Christmas Eve, probably, or maybe Christmas Day. Um, so I'd like to just explain to you a little bit about what we're about to hear and experience. Um, I suppose we should start with what's Vespers, and it, it is a worship service, and it goes right back to the Middle Ages, because it was in the Middle Ages that developed, we have evidence probably as early as the sixth century, of especially in monastic traditions, that the day was divided into hours. And at certain hours, you had to stop whatever you were doing and have a small worship service, or in some cases, slightly larger. And they were, went throughout the day. The first one um, would take place, it was called matins, and that sounds like the French word matin for morning. Well, it was very early in the morning because it was before dawn. And then you would have the one called lauds, which was at daybreak. And the service for Lauds has quite a bit of wonderful praise of God for the new day kind of a text to it. Then came ones which only get named by their sort of numbers. It's called Prime, Terse, Sext, and Known. And they are also known as the Little Hours because they obviously were during the working day. So Prime was theoretically at six in the morning, or, but you know, these things were very proximate, especially given the fact that not everybody had a timepiece. And then uh, one was in the mid-morning, one was at noon, and one was in the middle of the afternoon. And then came uh, the Vesper service, which was at twilight. And then there was one called Compline, or Compline, which was just before you went to bed. So this is the way the monastic tradition was organized. And you had these moments through every day that you stopped and had this little service. Now, these services consisted mostly of the recitation of psalms. And in the course of a week, you were supposed to get through all 150 psalms. But of course, if you had eight services a day, that was no problem. You could do that with, without any difficulty because you'd do five or six psalms in each service. So there wasn't, this was not a mass, of course, and there were no sermons. There were just these recitations of the psalms, and they were just recited, spoken. There was a, a gradually musical elaboration crept into some of them. Lauds and Vespers, which were kind of the beginning and the end of the day, were also graced with beautiful canticles, other biblical texts which would be recited at that point. And Vespers always had the Magnificat, the Magnificat being the song of Mary that's in the Bible, My Soul Magnifies the Lord. And it's a wonderful text. You'll see it in your program. We sing it tonight. So whenever you have a Vespers service, you always have the Magnificat. Now, of course, when I talk about the monastic tradition and right back into the Middle Ages, this is Catholic liturgy. In the 16th century, as we know, uh, and not earlier than the 16th century, but it sort of really bubbles up in the 16th century, all sorts of Christians, Catholics, who say, actually, there's a lot of problems with the church. The way the popes are behaving is terrible. There are certain things that we don't believe in and we don't think it's the right thing. And they try and reform the church. And it's, it's not exactly successful. And there's splits, which is called the Reformation. And of course, like so many movements in history, people are often united in what they don't like, but to find a better solution, they're not always agreed. So the Reform, the Reformation splits into many different kinds of, of Protestant traditions. And the one that we're interested in tonight, of course, is the Lutheran, which was really, in some ways, the first one. It starts in Germany with Martin Luther, and that gives the name to Lutheranism. And one of the things, as musicians, that we find very interesting about the Reformation is the sort of division between some of the Reformed traditions which were very suspicious of music. Because the Catholic Church, by this time, had a very rich and elegant and sophisticated musical tradition. But reformers were somewhat suspicious of certain aspects of Catholic uh, culture and liturgy and so on, and theology even. 
And so sometimes music got caught up in that, and elaborate and beautiful music was almost considered too papist in some ways, to use a derogatory term in the 16th century from the reformers. Not so the Lutherans. And in some ways, it's because of Martin Luther himself. He loved music, and he was deeply moved by music. And he actually wrote music a little bit himself. He certainly wrote words to hymns. And he believed that music could be used very much to improve and to direct the, the uh, congregation in a service of worship. So there's always been a very rich musical tradition in the Lutheran aspect of or if, uh, denomination of, of the Reformation. And thank goodness it was, because in a way it, it, it uh, means that there's a wonderful tradition that starts with Lutheranism, and of course J.S. Bach and, and all the comp lots of other composers that we can name grew up in that tradition. One of the aspects of all the Reformed traditions, but especially Lutheranism, was that you didn't have to completely reinvent worship services, but it was very important that the congregation understand what's going on in the worship service, because of course the Catholic worship service is, was still by and large done in Latin. And by this time in the 15th and 16th centuries, you had to be highly educated to be able to speak Latin. Lots of people did, but you, you only if you got an education. So the sort of no average person would not be able to understand really what was going on in the service. And so there was a great deal of emphasis in services in the vernacular, and in the, in the case of Germany, of course, into German. And with that went another emphasis that everybody should participate in the music making. That as, as a congregant in a, in a service, you should have a chance to actually sing, as opposed to only listen. Sometimes if you went to a Catholic service, you could go to hear beautiful, beautiful music. But there weren't that many opportunities to participate. They did have hymns, but not to the same extent that the Lutherans did, and not to the same extent that they really emphasized uh, hymns in your own language. So in the first hundred years or so of the Reformation, there are literally thousands of new German hymns written, which we call chorales. And it's an, just an outpouring. Everybody wanted to write a hymn. Martin Luther set the bar high because he wrote some wonderful hymns. And he would sometimes borrow music from a popular tune or something, even from a Catholic hymn, and he would translate it. Or we think that he wrote a couple of tunes himself, and a couple of the chorales that we'll be hearing tonight are by Martin Luther, most famously von Himmel hoch, which uh, from a heaven on high, the, the, the angel's tale uh, at Christmas time. So there is this wonderful emphasis on these chorales in early Lutheranism. And so, in fact, the, the mass that Lutherans still observed, and they did observe a mass regularly, it was almost like the Catholic mass, but translated. So there's a Kyrie and a Gloria and a Credo and an Agnus Dei and so on. It's often translated into German. The Vespers service, um, as I mentioned in the Catholic tradition, is this recitation of psalms. By this time, it had become five psalms and the Magnificat. So the Lutherans, they're not, again, as I said, trying to reinvent the wheel. They think we need to have a Vespers service. It's very nice to have a service towards the end of the day, and you kind of close things down a little bit. Um, and so they have some of the same elements, but not all. And we've often been intrigued as to why that service changed much more than the Mass did. And it has to do with what went on on an average Sunday in the Lutheran Church because they would observe a mass in the morning and then have a vespers later in the afternoon. And they always maintained the Magnificat, so it's going to be there. But the number of psalms dwindles from about five down to one, sometimes two. But then there are things in the Lutheran vespers service which have no place in a Catholic vespers service. And they are a recitation of the Ten Commandments, the Creed, which you say in a Mass, so you've already said it that day. The Lord's Prayer, which again, you say in the Mass, but you don't say it again in a Vesper service, or not in a Catholic Vesper service. And these are all actually, what we, uh, has been uh, discovered is that in between the morning service and the afternoon service, there was catechism. This is when the young people learned the basics of their faith. 
And of course, when you're a, a, an aspiring or young Christian, you learn the Ten Commandments, and you learn the Lord's Prayer, and you learn the basics of a creed. And these are all done in, in German, of course, now. So the idea was that there were these catechism classes between the morning service and the afternoon, and then they were encouraged to the children to go, or the young people to go to the Vesper service, and they would hear, sometimes recited or in musical settings, these elements which they had just been studying in their catechism class. So when we try and recreate a Vespers, we have to know all of this thing and that, all of these elements, and that's what we're going to be following through in, in this evening's performance is, and by the way, it's going to run without an intermission because although we're not f feeling like a service, we're not going to break it up just like a, a service would, would run uh, consecutively. So this brings us to the main composer of this evening's music, which is Michael Pretorius. He is the first really great Lutheran composer. Um, as I said, uh, Martin Luther wrote a few things, and there was another man named Johann Walter who wrote some beautiful motets and hymns early on, but he, they're not nearly as important uh, com as composers as Michael Pretorius, who lives towards the end of the 16th century and into the beginning of the 17th century. And almost he wrote a great deal of music. His complete works in the library is about 20 volumes and takes about this much space on the, on the, in the shelves over at the Edward Johnson building if you want to go and ever have a look at, Mont at Michael Pretorius' complete works. Almost all of them have some element of a chorale in them, which again shows how important the chorales were. Many of these settings are quite straightforward because he was a true believer in this reform movement, and he really wanted to make sure that hymns were easily understood, easily sung, that everyone could participate. And um, so a lot of his music is settings of hymns and reworkings of hymns and those kinds of things. He, he worked for a while at a court in uh, Wolfenbüttel, which is in the north of Germany, not that well known. And then in 1613, the, the duke for whom he was working uh, died, and he lost a, a, a serious patron of music. And we know that he traveled at that time to a very important center in Germany, in Dresden. And Dresden was where the elector of Saxony had his court and his chapel. And so it was a major city, and it was a kind of much more international city, and it had a lot of Italian musicians. And of course, at the beginning of the 17th century, the Italians were kind of inventing the Baroque. And the sort of extravagance, uh, this is opposed to Renaissance music, which we think of in the 16th century, and in the 17th we start talking about the Baroque, which has a number of distinct elements. It's much more emphasis on solo singing versus uh, choral uh, polyphony when you think of Palestrina or William Byrd, and you think of these beautiful choral pieces in five and six parts. There's a, a great deal more emphasis on soloists and on the virtuosity of soloists, both vocal soloists and instrumental soloists. They invent this system of what's called basso continuo, where you just have a bass line to support the harmonies, and you have chords, and then you have instruments, any kind of instrument that can play a bass note, and a chord is allowed into the continuo section. So that's why you get these long-necked lutes, or harps, or any kind of keyboard instrument can all do these kinds of things. And these instruments become very important in the music making of the time. So Dresden was a real center of this very new kind of music making. And when uh, Pretorius went traveling after this duke had died that was very supportive and didn't look like maybe he was going to even have a job at Wolfenbüttel for a while. Anyways, he spent quite a bit of time in Dresden and was very influenced by this latest Italianate Baroque style of writing. And in 1619, he produces a big volume which is very different from anything else he had produced. And it's full of these new Baroque techniques. And you're going to hear, especially in the Magnificat that we're doing tonight, this, we chose that one specifically because of its sort of brilliance of its many aspects of, of Baroque music making that you'll hear in, in this piece. Um, Pretorius is interesting in a number of other ways. He was a great, uh, well, not a good writer, but he wrote a great deal of, of information about music making. Some of it is directed at Lutheran churches. This is how you should 
do the kind of music. But he was also interested in all sorts of music at the time, and he wrote big, almost encyclopedias. And we're very grateful to him because there's one of the ones he wrote about all the instruments that you can find during his time. And it's a real beautif beautifully uh, with woodcut illustrations of all the instruments that he could ever imagine uh, were being used at that time. And other instructions on how to performance practice should, should work and so on. So he's a very important uh, composer. Um, and um, so this is the music that we're going to be doing tonight. We're, we're hearing one psalm. We're going to hear a Lord's Prayer, a Ten Commandments, a Credo. We're going to hear a Magnificat. And then the other elements of a, of a Vesper service were just short prayers and a hymn or two. They would use instrumental music from time to time, so we we're going to have a couple of instrumental pieces. Especially they would use it if someone had to process somewhere and a, a priest was going from the top to the pulpit or something, there would be instrumental music to cover that kind of thing. So that's what we'll, we've added as well. One of the interesting things about Pretorius' music is that it doesn't very often tell you exactly what instrument should play on what line. It does sometimes, but not uh, quite frequently it doesn't. So it allows uh, a group like ours to be quite flexible and to kind of choose what we would like. And he has in, in his publications, very often he'll have instructions, but he'll have many options for you. And he'll say, this line would sound good on a cornetto or something, and then this one might work well on a flute. Or if you do this with voices, then put this instrument in here. And, and he even says things that you might not otherwise not think of at all, like, put this down the octave. And, and it'll sound even better if you play it on a bassoon down the octave. So it's, he's a, it's a real treasure trove, his music for uh, the different kinds of ways that you can perform this. So I should say that what you're going to hear tonight is kind of our interpretation of this music. It's not like a Beethoven symphony, where unless you know someone's doing a takeoff, when you go to hear Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, it'll be the same instruments every time. Every orchestra plays with the instruments that he asked for. Um, but not this case. You might hear some of this music sometime, uh, and I hope you do. I hope other people do. Pretorius, uh, it's wonderful music, with other instrumentation. So how did we decide what kind of instruments we would use? Well, of course, just like Pretoria says, it often depends who you've got to hand. <laughs> so but there are certain kinds of, of sounds that we know he liked and, and, and was used in, in these churches, because we do have records of the kinds of players that were sometimes on salary or could be asked to join in a worship service from a, a court. Uh, ensemble, for instance. So we do have a group of early brass instruments. And by that, we, in this case tonight, we have three sackbuts. Sackbuts, as many of you will know, are early trombones. Um, they come, like so many instruments of the time, in different sizes. So a modern trombone is such that it can almost cover from the top right to the bottom although there's, there's still a modern bass trombone. But, um, so what you'll see here are, uh, is an alto sackbut, a tenor sackbut, and a bass sackbut. And they're just like a trombone, the idea of a slide that goes in and out. Um, there are some differences from modern trombones. The, the, the two smaller ones are definitely smaller than a modern trombone. The flare, meaning where it comes out in a modern trombone, is much wider which gives it more of that kind of brassy ba, 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 kind of quality, whereas if it's like this, which you'll notice, they're kind of, it's much narrower at the end. It gives it a sort of softness and a sweetness to it. And on top, instead of having trumpets, which they did use occasionally in churches, but the, what, the instrument which was most beloved to use in church situations like this for the high parts was called a cornetto. And some of you will know about a cornetto, it's not, strictly speaking, a brass instrument at all because it's not made of metal, it's made of wood. So in some sense, it's a woodwind instrument. You do blow into it, but it does, it's unique in the woodwind family in that the mouthpiece looks like a little brass mouthpiece. You know how trumpet players have that little cup and they purse their lips? <laughs> and they blow in, and that's what makes the air vibrate, which makes the sound, is that pursing of your lips into this little cup. Well, that's what the end of, a, of the cornetto has. It's 
It's just a wooden tube with holes to vary the length of the tube. So in that sense, it's almost like a recorder, because a recorder is also just a wooden tube that you blow into and change the, length, change the notes by covering the holes. But a recorder, you just blow into a little hole. And in a cornetto, you purse your lips and blow into this little brass-like mouthpiece. It also happens to be curved a little bit. And the other thing which confuses people is that then, very traditionally, and you'll see it tonight, the whole thing is wrapped in leather. So you can't see the wood at all. <laughs> so you might not know that it was a woodwind underneath that leather covering. Um, why the leather covering? I've asked cornetists, and they, they're not sure how it evolved that way sometimes. It has something to do with the acoustic properties of the instrument, but it's always covered in, in leather. So that's our kind of brass section, which will be over on this side of the stage. You can see here a harp. And this is a Baroque harp. Those of you who know about modern harps, you know there are pedals which actually change the length of the string so you can get different chromatic notes. There's no pedals on this. The pedals are not going to come for another hundred years, a couple of hundred years, really. Of course, harps had been around for a long time. You probably remember, or even with the Tron Consort, you've seen us play a medieval harp, which is like a lap harp, a little thing. And this is an interesting development in the instrument that it gets so big because, again, it's really designed because of this idea of the basso continuo that I mentioned. Because they were very interested, as I said, in instruments which could play a bass note and a chord. Well, of course, harps can play chords because you've got all your fingers to play chords. But you can't play low notes unless the string is long. Now, just like in a piano, the lowest notes are those long strings. The high ones are the little ones, which is why it's got that shape, any keyboard like that. So the only way to like a, let a harp play low notes is by lengthening the string. So you have to big build a bigger triangular frame in which to have the long notes that you can actually play. And in, sen in a sense, you're the next, next to the harp is Lucas Harris playing Theorbo, and that's a long-necked lute. And it's the very same idea. Renaissance lutes are smaller. Medieval lutes, even smaller. They're, but the Renaissance lute gets about like this, and you've got a string length about like this, which is very lovely, but it's not that low a note. You want to play a, uh, be able to have real bass notes on your lute, you have to have a longer string. So what do you do? You build an extension so that now the string can run from there all the way down to the, to the, near the fingers. So that's why they built these extensions because they wanted to have instruments that could play the low notes as well as chords at the same time. And so those are two members of our continuo section and, of course, the organ. And then instruments which I must say you, you'll be more familiar with, which is violins and violas and cello and recorder, all of which you'll probably have seen. I mean, they were, when I say you, you know them, the violin family wasn't all that old. It was developed at the beginning of the 16th century, also by the Italians, but it spread across Europe very quickly. And so there were uh, violins and violas in France and Germany and England by the uh, beginning of the Baroque period, for sure. So those are the instruments that we have. Um, something else which is interesting is um, about the way the, the, this particular Vesper service will run is that in the Magnificat, which is this poem, given to the mouth, in the mouth of Mary in, in the Bible, in the New, New Testament. And as I said, it's a very radical poem about the mighty falling down from their thrones and the humble being raised up and so on. It's a great piece of literature. Um, but usually it runs right through. When you do it in a Catholic Vesper service, you just say the whole thing in order. In sometimes, in, it developed in the Lutherans' uh, service that they would stop the Magnificat and insert um, a, a chorale into it, just to give a chance for the congregation to sing again. And they would do this particularly at the big feast days and particularly at Christmas. So we're going to do that at a couple of moments in the Magnificat. It stops, and the, and the piece that we chose by, by Pretorius actually is divided very clearly into four parts. So there's part one and then you can put something in. Part two, put another thing in. Part three, and put another thing in. So all of these um, allow us to insert Christmas carols, basically, into 
the Magnificat, which is what we'll do. Scholars have wondered why this tradition arose. One theory that I just recently read about, and it's hard to know, it was just proposed as a theory, there isn't enough evidence, was that it was actually because at Christmas time, just like today in churches, there were often sort of pageants telling the Christmas story. And there was often a creche set up at the front of the church. And they would have, you know, people as shepherds coming and they, uh, Mary and Joseph and the baby and, and the three kings and so on. And they would have these pageants and that these carols allowed for the pageants to take place. This was to accompany, because one of the most famous ones that they used was von Himmelhoch, which is the angel saying, I bring you good news. Or a couple of the lullabies, you'll hear a lullaby called Josef Lieber here tonight, and there would be a chance to have a little bit of, of a kind of domestic scene at, at the creche. We're not sure, but it does allow for wonderful opportunities to hear. The other thing I will say is that the Lutherans, even, as I said, some, they didn't throw everything out. In fact, even though they had this emphasis on the vernacular, sometimes in the most elegant churches, you would still hear aspects of the service sung in Latin. So occasionally they would do the Magnificat in Latin. Those of you who are, will, will know about J.S. Bach's famous Magnificat, it's in Latin. But he was a good Lutheran composer, but he was working at a situation in Leipzig, a big university town, very important, lots of educated people. They liked to hear their Magnificat done in Latin sometimes, so he said it in Latin. But even so, when they did that, sometimes they would have a verse of a hymn, for instance, and sing one verse in Latin, and then the congregation would respond in German. So you wouldn't expect the whole congregation to sing in Latin. And this was called Wechselgesang. Wechsel being to change. Remember when you used to go and have to change your money? At Wechsel in, in Germany, that's what they would talk about, these places to exchange your money. Anyways, this is this kind of uh, singing exchange between Latin and German. And we're going to ask you later, and we'll, we'll have a little rehearsal, to participate in this. Whereas we would like to sing a verse of some of the hymns and then have you sing a hymn in alternation with us will join you so you feel comfortable. And of course, in the spirit of that, you'll sing in English because the whole idea is that we, in Lutheranism, you sing in your own language. So that's why we'll ask you to sing also just a couple of times in the evening with us. Well, um, I see from my watch that I need to come to an end and I hope that's given you a little background to appreciate what we're doing this evening. But before we break up, are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Yes, Mel. Uh, David, um, how extensively, yes. but in this period, earlier, how extensive was the organ used? Right, the question is, how extensively was the organ used? Well, this, I would say, is one of the, ways, one of the places where this recreation slightly falls down because church organs were definitely used. Uh, in already at this time. And again, it's, it's a sort of North European development. As you can imagine, organs with one, two, sometimes even three keyboards plus a pedal board, and you have all these stops which allow you to um, have different sounds. So that becomes where you press this pipe. Sometimes it sounds like a flute. Sometimes it sounds more like a trumpet. It's an extremely complicated piece of technology especially before electricity. And this all has to be, the air has to go through these pipes and down the right channel so that you have the right thing, all by a big, huge bellows that's being worked. So it's, it's really high tech. I've, I've read somewhere that they think that perhaps at the beginning of the 17th century, the most sophisticated piece of technology on earth was the organ. It, because it's so complicated. I mean, I know they could, you know, we could build cannons and build sackbutts and so on, but it's nothing like building an organ. Anyways, the Germans and no North uh, Europeans in general were on the forefront of this, and they knew they had something very interesting. And so, yes, they did use the church organ. Now, the trouble with that is that we could consider this organ here, although it's nothing like Baroque specification. And then, 
you spend a lot of money and time tuning an organ, <laughs> and so you can't always count. We've done this performance other churches too. So we'll have the chamber organ and we'll put it as loud as we can from time to time. But you're right, there would have been more organ uh, involved. I will say one thing, we've recorded this performance, it's on CD out there, and for the recording, we used in Knox College Chapel here at the University of Toronto, there is a wonderful Baroque specification organ and um, we know the man who was, uh, had something to do with its being in, uh, installed, and it's, re it's modeled after an existing organ in, I think, Denmark, and it's a fabulous instrument, as long as it's been kept up, I haven't heard it, but anyways, we decided that we so much needed the organ for the recording that we did some of the recording in that hall and used the Baroque organ, but no, it's a, it would have been a bigger part of the music making than, than uh, we're going to hear tonight. Well, I'm getting signs that we need to stop because at this point, of course, you need to vacate where you are and go to your proper seat and we'll let the rest of the audience in. And thank you very much and enjoy the evening.